Honourable Member for St. James North. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank you. I first wish to say that I intervene in this debate here today with the pleasure and on behalf of the great people of St. James North. And I must say that the Honourable Member who presented this debate may very well have turned out to be an outstanding international trade minister if he had been allowed to remain in that position mm -hmm. to which he was appointed in 2008. In fact, he might very well have been in line for an Oscar award right now if, as the Honourable mm -hmm. Leader of the Opposition said, if he had gone into acting. But we on this side believe and we know that other cabinet members agree with us, including the Minister of Agriculture, who wrote a letter to his ministry officials and told them in writing that he must not deal with the, that they must not deal with the Minister of Finance without his permission and consent. So he knows that, but we certainly on this side believe that the Honourable Member for St. Michael North West appointment to the position of Minister of Finance by the late David Thompson and his continuing appointment at the behest of the Honor Right Honourable Prime Minister has been one of the worst appointments by the political leadership of any country anywhere in the world to a public office since Categula the Roman Emperor appointed his horse as Council of Rome. He continues, the Honourable Member for St. Michael North West continues to blame an international recession no long past for the incompetence and callousness of his government. These budgetary proposals can only be described as an ad hoc attempt by the DLP government to show up their disastrous management of the economy over the last eight years. The Honourable Finance Minister says that there has been a resumption in the growth of the economy, yet this nation is one of the only three Caribbean countries to have experienced an annual negative growth since the year 2008. The Honourable Finance Minister says that the economy is growing again, yet Barbados is the most indebted country in the Caribbean per capita and among the seven most indebted countries globally. The Honourable Minister of Finance says that the economy has realised an improvement, yet the fiscal deficit at 6.9% for 2015-2016 is higher than the 5.8% that it was for the previous year. That Honourable hims Member himself says that this, of course, was disappointed. That, those were his words two days ago. That Honourable Member, the presenter of this debate, still predicts a year-end growth, he said, in the economy of 1.5%. That is unrealistic, considering that the growth in the first, first half of this year, according to the Central Bank report, was only 1.3%. And even the most uneducated person in Barbados knows that the first half of the year it's always better economically for Barbados than the second half. That the tourists come mainly in the first half of the year. And of course, in a tourism-driven economy, there is no way that the first half of the year you're going to only realize a 1.3% growth figure, but overall, you're going to get a 1.5%. This government, Madam Deputy, Speaker has utilized this budget 
to impose taxes number 34, 35, and 36 since it came into office on the already overwhelmingly taxed Barbadian public. The Honourable Finance Minister has tried at least five different fiscal strategies since 2009, all at a huge sacrificial cost to the ordinary citizens of this country. And all of them have failed singularly and or jointly to improve the quality of lives of the vast majority of Barbadians. Except, of course, you are a member of the Democratic Labour Party fatted caste or their friends. Yet, the Honourable Finance Minister now imposes a national social responsibility level, levy. Sweet sounding word, rhetoric. All it means is a tax, which at the rate of 2% taxation on imported goods, with the exception of goods for the manufacturing, agricultural, and tourism sectors, plus VAT, will again substantially increase the cost of living of Barbadians. This new tax will in fact directly increase the cost of living in this country from as early as next month by 3 to 4 percent. This is yet another broken promise by the Democratic Labour Party administration, which in 2008 stated that the reduction in cost of living was to be its number one priority. How does this administration really expect the over 20 percent of Barbadians in our country who now live below the poverty line and who are already struggling dearly to survive, how do they expect them to exist? How do they expect my constituents in St. James North to try to make, to, who try as they may to find employment but can't, including those thousands of persons who lost their jobs in the public service of this country after being told by no less an authority than the Prime Minister of this country that they will not lose their jobs. How will they survive? How have will those thousands, 16,000 plus, who have lost their jobs in the, pub, in the private sector, largely because of the economic mismanagement by this administration, in recent years, how will they survive? How will those persons who are unemployed, who have dependent children to look after, who have old parents on whom they depend, who has rent or mortgage to pay, utility bills to pay, how will they live except by the grace of our Lord Almighty? You tell us what we should do now. The imposition of this tax by the minister demonstrates the callousness and don't care attitude of this Democratic Labour Party government towards poor people in this country, towards persons with disabilities, and towards the middle economic class in this country. It clearly shows why the Barbados Labour Party in October 2013 brought a no confidence motion against that Honourable Minister of Finance, and in May this year indeed brought a similar motion against the whole government. The two million dollars to be given to the welfare department is an insult to those who are the most vulnerable in this country, including persons with disabilities and senior citizens. Having already cut the welfare budget by 12.5 percent in the 2014 estimates, and taken many persons off the welfare list who were on previously, there is no way that a paltry sum of $2 million can alleviate the financial challenges which daily confront thousands of Barbadians, particularly now that this levy is being implemented. The proposed $10 weekly increase in non-contributory pensions for senior citizens is sufficient to pay only a water bill. And that is if you're lucky enough to be living in a part of Barbados that gets water, a basic human commodity. 
this increase, the first in many years for non for all age pensioners, cannot offset the harsh fiscal measures which this government has imposed on senior citizens over the last few years. Almost incredibly, from a political party that previously used to profess how much it cares about poor people, this new levy is not the only additional tax in this budget. An increased bank assets tax up from 0.2% to 0.35% has also been announced. This tax will undoubtedly be passed on by the banks to its ordinary customers. Furthermore, this Scalas government has proposed an amendment to the Income Tax Act to take an increased payment of withholding tax at the rate of 6.5%, up from the usual 12.5% on partial withdrawals from registered retirement saving plans by Barbadians who are now financially strapped and have to be forced to dig deep into their savings after being encouraged by a previously enlightened Barbados Labour Party government to invest in these instruments. Not even that the government could look after. They increased the withholding tax up from 12.5%, 16.5%. And Barbadians, ordinary Barbadians, who have lost their jobs, had the salaries, no salary increase for six years. Cost of living gone up. Inflation by over 30% since this Democratic Labour Party government came into office. Having now to dig into our RSPs and you're being taxed more heavily for it. All of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, is against the background of a decision by this cabinet, authenticated by the signature of the Honourable Minister of Finance on the 15th of April 2016 on an order to increase the salaries of cabinet ministers and parliamentary secretaries by 10% up above what they received in the previous month. Under circumstances where public servants and government employees have not received a salary increase for over six years. Spectacularly, the Honourable Member for St. Lucie has insensitively commented publicly on Facebook that public sector employees should now voluntarily agree to a pay cut that the parliamentarians took their pay cut for two years and no public sector employees should voluntarily agree to a 10% pay cut too. You imagine that, Madam Deputy Speaker? That that honourable member still remains in the cabinet of Barbados after publicly saying so. The late Prime Minister was absolutely correct in his judgment that that honourable member would not see the inside of a cabinet once he headed it. Not surprisingly, however, though, Madam Deputy Speaker, the honourable member for St. Michael Central, who is in here with the benefit of a minibus load of votes, who speaks in Parliament on no more than five occasions annually, no more than five times a year does he speak in this parliament, betrayed by his body language when the honourable leader of the opposition revealed these ministerial salary increases, his uncompromising desire that he wanted his $16,500 a month. No, up from $15,000 a month. Don't mind that his ministerial mandate is to preside over people who are the most vulnerable in this society and who have greater needs than anybody else. Well, you don't give your happy salary. The Minister's no. of Finance's announcement that this administration intends to finance and or reduce transfers to ministries and statutory boards by about $50 million annually for the next four years 
revealed the government that, according, and I agree totally with the right honorable member for St. Peter, is taking blind leaps in the dark without knowing where it will land. This government, a government must be able to prioritize its national development agenda. That is its job. It must know which areas can be cut in the interest of our people's progress. It must know which areas cannot be cut, on the contrary, in the interest of our people's progress. Where will these new financial cuts now be made in an environment where the government's delivery of social services to our constituents is already so poor? Nowhere, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this government's failure in its ability to deliver our, to our people more aptly seen than in its, its policy towards the funding of tertiary education of the children of poor working class and struggling middle class Barbadians. <laughs> While I join with the Honorable Minister of Education in calling for all defaulting borrowers of student revolving loans to pay their dues to the government and people of Barbados, the undeniable fact is that the member for Christchurch East Central has to take ministerial re responsibility for the present situation where persons do not know whether they can take up their places at the end of this month at the University of the West Indies, at Hugh Wooden Law School, or at any other tertiary institution into which they have been accepted because the funds to, of, in the Ministry of Education to which they applied for a loan are now no longer there and that they are unable to finance them. This situation ought to have been easily predicted by a minister who had a hand on his ministry. The worst minister of education out of 13 in this country should have been dealt with a long time ago. We have not been told when this government reasonably expects to fulfill all the conditions of the Caribbean Development Bank loan of 15 million, which the Honorable Finance Minister mentioned two days ago, and which we know have not been fulfilled. So this issue about a Caribbean Development loan of 15 million will soon become fairy tale. When will the Student Revolving Loan Fund be able to access these monies? The Honourable Minister of Education in last year's budget, almost exactly a year ago, promised to have a national consultation with the people of Barbados on the issue of funding tertiary education in Barbados. I, at that time, Madam Deputy Speaker said I look forward to that consultation. I, in fact, commended the Honourable Minister of Health for doing that, I went to one of the consultations that he had, and I said that at least the Minister of Education is taking a leaf out of the Minister of Health's pocket. You know, Madam Deputy Speaker, not one national consultation on education has been held since then. Even though the Minister of Education made that promise. But that doesn't surprise me, Madam Deputy Speaker, because the Minister of Education... It, it, this is his style, making promises and commitments before this parliament, like sending documents on educational policy to the opposition office and not doing so 18 months after. So that is his style. So that doesn't surprise me. The Honourable Education Minister and his government have made a complete mess of the development of young people by their buggling of the bursaries, by their buggling of the grants, and now by their buggling of the student revolving loan fund. This is a government that has failed to give the majority of our young people a realistic belief and hope that they can now acquire the knowledge, the skills, the training, which are required to assist them in realizing their full potential and in being the best citizens of this country that they can be. The youth of this country deserve better. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
the aftermath of the decision three years ago to impose payment of tuition fees on Barbadian students at the University of the West Indies and at other tertiary institutions highlights the complete incapacity of this cabinet to do its duty to our people by ensuring the continued development of our human resources. Education has been seen by every post-independent government in this country except this present administration as a public good. Every government for the last 50 years found money to afford Barbadians with free tertiary education even though they could not fight, even though they, they could not find it, there's no government in the history of the independence of this country that could afford free tertiary education. Yet every single one found the money, the millions of dollars every year to fund it so that poor people's children can rise from the circumstances of their birth and sit as prime minister in these chambers with the taxpayers of Barbados paying for this right honourable Prime Minister's education for 10 years, four degrees, paying for a minister in the other place for nine years for him to get one degree and they could sit around a cabinet and do this, commit this injustice, social and economic injustice to the people of Barbados. The inability of this administration to understand that our society just cannot afford the socio-economic fallout associated with this change in national educational policy has been one of the primary causes of the decline in our status as a leading development country in the world. The Minister of Finance, the, right on, the, the Honourable Minister of Finance, had the opportunity in this budget to restore some of the tax allowances which were removed from the people's earning capacity last year. He has not restored any of these tax allowances, even though he hinted a few months ago that he may have restored some. So the tax allowances that he took off last year, whereby you give your church, you give your school, you give the Salvation Army, your service club, all of those taken off harshly by this government, causing a tremendous social and economic impact on this country on those organizations, non-governmental and churches that were assisting the government in terms of social welfare of people in this country. All of those come off. The Minister of Finance promising a few months ago that he would restore some, not one mention of that. But yet cabinet ministers, one after the other, praising this budget. How much more time? Ten there has been no stimulus in this budget, Madam Deputy Speaker, for ordinary Barbadians to acquire affordable housing. Honourable Member, you have five minutes left. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Lucy, since taking up the housing mandate three and a half years ago, has not delivered 25 housing solutions to the people of this country. Okay. Not 25! Goto remaining like a ghost town, unable to make a decision on it. Coverly, about a thousand houses and, and more than half unoccupied. One would have thought that a finance minister would have taken the opportunity two days ago to announce some kind of package to help alleviate one of the great social problems of this country, housing. He failed to do so. He has failed to address the critical issue of our continually, our continuing annual decline as a nation in which to do business. 
where we now rank at number 119, down from 103 two years ago. A matter of which I know the Honorable Member for St. James though, because he speaks about it publicly, is concerned, but he seems to be unable to deal with it. Not even within his own ministry can he deal with it. Barbados is becoming a more and more uncompetitive society and is losing its previously cutting edge in economic and productive activity to other regional countries. The announcement, Madam Deputy Speaker, of an in the future appointment of temporary public officers who have been employed in such a position for more than three years is smoke and mirrors the usual tactic of the Democratic Labour Party to try to trick the people of this country. One of the last acts of the last Barbados Labour Party administration on the 31st of December 2007 was to pass and have the Governor General assent to a Public Services Act under which after one year acting in a position, you should be appointed unless the Governor General frees the position. That was the position, but the, the Honorable Attorney General would not understand that. He does not even understand first year constitutional law because he certified that you could fingerprint Barbarians at ports of entry and exit in Barbados in breach of the fundamental rights clause 23 of the provision of the Constitution. Anything that a first year law student at Cave Hill would understand, he didn't understand that. So I, so, so I, so I excuse the Honourable Minister of Finance, who is not a lawyer, for 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 bringing that for bringing that two days ago, because he has an Attorney General as principal legal advisor to the government who does not understand first year constitutional law. But that, but that is, that, that announcement is comparable to the, to the present Minister of, of Transport, the Honourable Member for St. Philip North, who when he was Minister of Housing, three months after the 2008 election, went around with letters handing them to, uh, to people in the pine, in, in the Honourable Member for St. Michael South East constituency and in other constituencies handing them letters saying that they will become owners of their units, something that now over eight years afterwards has not been done. They could not carry the letters to a bank and say, I am now the owner of this. Let, let me a mortgage, use my unit as collateral, even now they are not the owners. So this what the Minister of Finance announced two days ago. is no joy for public servants because they had that right over eight and a half years ago. It is the fault of the Democratic Labour Party administration for failing to implement that law. And even now, even now, they are putting it down the line by setting up a committee to look at the procedure and the methodology and the legal and the, and, and the legality of appointing it when the law is there. That is, that is the Democratic Labour Party for you. Deception, lies and propaganda. We will leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, for another occasion as stated by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Honourable Member, your time is up. Ma Madam, can you grant me just a wind up, ma'am? Discussion on the prevailing corruption and spiritual wickedness in high places, which now permeate, permeates too large a part of our governance. Our country, under the Democratic Labour Party government, is no closer than before in getting out of the woods economically. This administration has failed to communicate any vision of how it hopes to develop our people and country at the macro level Thank you. over the next decade. Honourable Member, please take your seat. Your time is up. We need Madam, to stick to time. I'm obliged.